Hey there, friend. Welcome to my new series where I explain topics of biology in terrible ways. This is Bad Biology. Today I want to talk to you about gene flow. Gene flow is the transfer of genetic variation from one population group to another. People who study it call it migration, and that sounds like a pretty clear way of describing things if you've ever watched Planet Earth or literally any other nature documentary. But as is often the case, the meaning of words are muddy. Salmon. Hmm. So as you probably know, salmon are born in freshwater streams. They swim out to the ocean to get big enough to eat, uh, I mean breed, and they swim back again to spawn and make new delicious little babies. In this sense, they migrate a lot. But when we're talking about gene flow, salmon migrate very little. The actual mixing between populations is pretty low because the salmon actually return to the same stream they were born in. So the next stream over is basically a completely separate group of fish. They don't interbreed at all, except for the occasional accident. So even though they migrate a lot, they don't migrate. Got it? Great. So one of the ways that people represent gene migration is with a number they call the FST, and I'm not going to tell you what that means because it doesn't matter. So essentially the FST is a measurement of inbreeding. The number can range from 0 to 1, and a 1 means that the population is completely inbred. There's never any new gene introduction. An FST of zero means there's never any inbreeding at all. So every single new pairing is with an animal from outside of the group. Let's look at an example of an animal that migrates a lot and also migrates a lot. People. To talk about this, I'm going to mix in some completely unproven statistical models because I think they're interesting and I want to talk about them. If you want a complete education on this stuff, you can make your own channel. So, people. I don't know about other places in the world, but in the United States, people talk about their ancestors a lot. Especially around holidays, like St. Patrick's Day, which is a time where every Tom, Dick, and Harrington decides that they're Irish because seven generations ago, a single person came over here to escape something. But it's not just Americans who get kind of stuck on that stuff. Christopher Lee used to bring up the fact that he was descended from Charlemagne the Great on his mom's side. He would talk about how the Carandini family was one of the oldest and most respectable families in Europe, and he made all sorts of references to Charlemagne and his metal albums, because he thought that was a pretty big deal. Now, I've never seen his family tree, so I'm going to just go ahead and call him a liar, but I have seen the family tree of the Backer Dirks, which goes back to 582. You can find it online. The website says it goes back to 482, but it starts at uh, Arnulf of Metz, and Wikipedia says he was born in 582. So even though I've already shown you that you can never trust Wikipedia, I'm going to be a giant hypocrite and do it anyway. So you can follow this family forward through time, generation by generation, and hey, there's my sixth great-grandmother. It's a small world, after all. Stop it. Okay. So let's put a pin in that. Joseph Chang is a statistician at Yale, and Professor Chang had a question. How closely related is anybody? Joseph had this idea that you can take a population size and predict how far back the most recent common ancestor of that group is. Now, you might know about some of the common ancestors that have been brought up in the past. The easiest to pinpoint are known as mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosome Adam. If you aren't familiar, you get a direct copy of your mitochondrial DNA from your mom and a direct copy of your Y chromosome from your dad, assuming that you're male. So we can look at the DNA of these two things from people all over the planet, figure out how different they are, and then use some assumptions about mutation rates to figure out how long ago we had the same great granddad and grandmom, and it's somewhere around three to 4,000 generations ago. Now, to be clear, these people didn't live at the same time or in the same place, and they were never the only people alive on the planet. That answer wasn't good enough for Joseph, so he drew a bunch of dots and connected them with lines at random, and came up with a quick, dirty equation for guessing the most recent common ancestor point for a population. And that equation is 1.77 log n, where n is the current population size, and the result is the number of generations back you have to go to find the same person in every single family tree. So let's look at Europe. 1.77 log 750 million. 16? Question mark? Okay. So that's about 500-ish years. Preposterous, right? He thought so too, so he made a little tiny bit of extra math. Just uh, 
just a little bit. Um, I, I, that's it. Stop. Stop. He made some extra assumptions about how often people move around and change towns, or marry in town versus the next town over, or rich people would have kids with poor people, and he came up with 600 years. 600 years ago, there's some person from Europe sitting in the family tree of everyone in Europe and of European descent. You might think that sounds weird, but Joseph was like, nah, this isn't good. One person is shit. I need to know when I'm related to everyone. And he called this the identical ancestor point, or IA point. So he ran some more numbers with some more assumptions, and the computer model said that at a thousand years ago, 20% of the people alive at the time have no living descendants today, and the other 80% are ancestors of everybody. It's just a computer model, and what does Professor Chang know anyway? Everyone knows you can make statistics say pretty much anything you want by playing with the numbers. So in 2014, a different group of people who do real science, uh, Peter Ralph and Graham Coop, decided to basically answer this question using real work. So they got a bunch of DNA samples from people all over Europe, ranging from England to Turkey, uh, 2,257, I think. And they started looking at the chunks of shared DNA, identifying about 2 million lengths to be compared. And... You see, when you're born, you get 50% of your DNA from each parent, but it doesn't get all mixed up. It's in lots of huge chunks that are identical with one parent or the other. And these are called identical by descent DNA. And each new generation, these bits can get mixed or changed by mutations, but it takes time to break them up. So the longer the chunks of identical DNA, the more closely related two people are. So they looked at these DNA chunks from all over Europe, and they said, hey, everyone in Europe has identical ancestors a thousand years ago. And since this was basically proof of Professor Chang's model, I bet he did a little dance, and it went a little something like this. You know, because he's a stats guy. Okay. So this is roughly true no matter where you live. A thousand years ago, you share all of your ancestors with your regional group. And that means that anyone who lived before a thousand years ago is also your ancestor. At least if you can prove that they have any living descendants today. So, I'm descended from Charlemagne. In your face, Mr. Lee. That wasn't enough for Joseph, because he's just too much of a mad lad, so he set about trying to make a computer model of the entire planet to find out how long ago all of us have the same ancestors. And this is where things get a little bit weird, because maths. So you have two parents, unless you're one of those weird parthenogenic turkey babies. And you have four grandparents, and eight great-grandparents, and it keeps going like this. But we only have about 25,000 genes, so once you go back more than 15 generations, you reach a point where you have more ancestors than you have genes. And when you go back 33 generations, you have more ancestors than there are base pairs in your DNA. Which means you didn't inherit anything from a lot of those people, even though you're descended from them. So this puts us in a territory where our boy Joseph can't be proven right by DNA analysis anymore. It's just pure computer models. Because of this, he went super conservative in all of his assumptions. I make bosses. We know basically when people started moving from one place in the planet to another, but we don't have very detailed numbers of how frequently they moved, so Joseph had to come up with numbers on his own. We know that Native Americans crossed from Siberia into Alaska by 12,000 BC, for instance. You can look at this map and see his assumptions. The dates are when people started moving. The small number is his assumption of people going back and forth. We knew, for instance, that the Inuit took boats back and forth between Russia and Alaska because of artifacts we found on either side of the gap. So we know people were trading, and that means people were mixing genetics. So he guessed at 10 people per generation in that area. Now to illustrate how low his numbers are, he assumed 100 people every generation crossed the Strait of Gibraltar. And in 1500 AD, he assumes 55 people leave one country for another within Eurasia in any given generation period. Just absurdly low numbers. 
He makes some assumptions about ports being where people would come and go most, different land masses limiting movement, and tried to match historical population sizes at given times throughout history, and his model spits out 1400 BC. It says we all share a common ancestor who probably worked in a dock on the Yangtze River in 1400 BC. So there must be something wrong here, right? The numbers, they're, they're too high. So he dials them back, he runs it again. Only this time it's not 10 people every generation going back and forth from Siberia to Alaska. This time it's one person every 10 generations. He does that across the board, and that's got to change things, right? Sort of. The new estimate is 1600 BC, with an estimated identical ancestors point of 5000 BC. Baffled? Remember that these are super low numbers. When he runs the same model using realistic numbers, numbers that match what we know about history, it pushes our global most recent common ancestor all the way up to 55 AD and moves our IA point to 2000 BC. Almost. You see, Tasmania was cut off by rising ocean levels in 6000 BC and remained isolated until 1803, so while they have the same common ancestor point, since people have been intermixing since 1803, their identical ancestor point has to be around 6000 BC. But that's the only exception on the planet. Now, before anyone asks me why we don't all look the same, put a pin in that question, because we'll talk about it next time when we discuss genetic drift and how local groups can alter the effective population size. Okay, so what does any of this have to do with gene flow? That's a fair question. Nothing. I wasted your time. No, not really. The Human Hat Map Project looked at genetic differences between massive numbers of people and decided that the human race has an FST of 0.12. Another way I've seen that put is 12% of the genes that make us human account for all of our differences. It's a very small number because even if we like to think otherwise, our differences are also very small. And that's kind of a shocking thing to think about. It forces you to reassess your relationship to everyone else. I want to end this with a quote from Chang at the end of the paper. Our findings suggest a remarkable proposition. No matter the language we speak or the color of our skin, we share ancestors who planted rice on the banks of the Yangtze, who first domesticated horses on the steppes of the Ukraine who hunted giant sloths in the forests of North and South America, and who labored to build the Great Pyramid of Khufu. That's powerful stuff. We'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks for staying to the end of the video. If you like what you saw and haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and turn on the notification bell. Check out one of our other videos, and if you like what we do, you can encourage us to make more videos by subscribing on Patreon or making a one-time donation over PayPal. Links are in the description. Thanks for all your continued support.